So this is John Reed. I am rejoined by Josh Greenbaum. Josh, how you doing? I'm great. I'm great. It's it's Friday. Um, so uh, yeah, we're we're at, at the end of a busy week, right? Because we were just in Las yep. Vegas. Uh, so Josh and I were at Acumatica Summit, and we were going to do an on-site version of you know kind of a event debrief, but we were both flat out brain fried. So Josh was like, "Why don't we do this when we get home?" So that's what we're doing. So we're actually doing this virtually, but we really just wanted to get a chance to rehash the event on Diginomica. I've written two fairly monstrous posts. Uh, one was kind of a review of the show from a customer perspective, and then. Today, I released an, an AI strategy post from a deeper conversation, drawing mostly Josh that drew on the conversation we had with uh, Ollie Johnny and Doug Johnson on sort of behind the announcements and stuff. So that's already out there. But what I really wanted to start with was, was your impressions because you haven't been to the show for a little while. And so now you're back. The company has grown considerably. But what were sort of your impressions getting back to this event? Like what struck you? What jumped out? Yeah, well, and and it was it was fascinating. You know, I did a, I actually did. I think I can say this out loud. I you know I did a strategy review for them back in 2018, um, and um, and what was fascinating is sort of look back at the notes from that, and to see where they've come, and and they've kind of hit the milestones, hit all the high points that they were talking about in terms of being you know being really well known in the industry in general, having a really successful vertical industry strategy. Um, being just, you know, you know, just really, uh, super customer friendly, you know, having that, having that customer focus, which is always easy to talk about. You can always say, let's, let's go do that, uh, to actually execute it and to have that kind of, you know, that kind of, frankly, that love that you sort of, I think felt, you know, uh, among the customers, I, I, I found it fascinating. I was very impressed. And, um, you know, and I'm still digesting. I mean, you're, you're, you're impressive because you, you're out there cranking out a copy already. I'm sitting here working on this sort of, you know, this conceptualization. How do I, how do I describe what I saw? And, and, you know, the thing that really struck me was the, you know, the, the again, the high quality of the customers and the variability of the customer base, how, you know, how different these companies are and yet how similar they all are. At, you know, underneath the hood, if you will, and why, and that similar similarity is what's driving them towards Acumatica. Um, and um, overall, really, really great conference. I, I, I really enjoyed myself, I have to admit. So I'm not going to really go through all of the news items and stuff because I've written about that and I, and I want to get kind of more deeper into your views instead. But the probably the most notable news item um, well, there were probably two. One was announcing the new professional services industry edition. Acumatic has been pretty careful about not doing too many of these vertical editions, but this one builds on a lot of the stuff they have already done in various areas like project accounting, but it is an additional layer. It's not just a repackaging. Um, and then um, the next thing was their announced principles of innovation, for, for which pertains to AI development principles, but also uh, other sort of emerging tech and while that was sort of that was sort of a pre-announcement because they're still finalizing some things uh internally ali johnny told us there and i wrote about this in my post how they're still working on it's really important to them to get some language right around things like guardrails and these solutions and because these solutions are known to run off the rails if they're not sort of ethically right. defined so we had some really good discussions about that and how and how partners you know might choose to adhere to that also and Ac acumatica's role in that but that's something we can maybe get into later. But those are kind of the, the newsy things. But I think one thing that was interesting to me last year, I stirred up a little bit of unintentional controversy around retail because it wasn't clear last year exactly what the future of the retail edition was. This year, it was much more clear where John Case was really, the CEO was very definitive. We're going to be doing a retail edition and we're still taking on a lot of e-commerce customers as well. But the interesting thing and the reason for the controversy last year was because there was this sort of thing. It wasn't that Acumatica's retail investments were going to go away, but it was this thing around everyone's a retailer now, right? So in addition yeah. to, in a, Acumatica has some really interesting retail customers, but then they have a whole bunch of manufacturing and distribution customers that are really interested in all kinds of different aspects of retail, right? Direct to consumer B2C. And that's all I want to bring it back to you now, Josh. Because the other thing you said to me on site that was interesting was how you were struck not just by the different types of customers, but just how 
how differently customer one customer can use the product, right? Because we talked to some customers that have pretty diverse business models. So you were yeah. struck by that also. Right. And, you know, I, I, I think that that sort of, one of the things, again, that, 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 you know, reflecting back five years or so, almost six years at this point, you know, the, the, the idea at the time was, you know, that, uh, man, it needs to go and find these, you know, find these customers where they are, skate to the puck, to use that, that overwrought term. Um, and, and that, you know, that requirement was very much uh, about, you know, you're not just doing one thing. You're going to be doing a lot of things. You are not just a manufacturer. You're a retailer. You're not just a retailer. You're omni-channel. You're not, you know, not just a manufacturer. You're a service company. So I think, I think being able to, being able to, you know, do that and, and, and seeing signs of that being very, very successful uh, was, was really, really impressive. Um, I think, you know, there are some, there are some, um, there are some very just fascinating customers. And I really went, went through this list. I started writing my own piece about it yesterday. I'm a little slower than you, but um, the, the, the extreme variability of the customers in terms of their segments. And yet the, again, these, these interesting commonalities uh, w- was fascinating to me. Um, you know, I, I, I really, um, I was really struck by the, you know, the need for companies to do very, um, very complex and very customer centric um, commerce. They, you know, there's, there's some really interesting examples. And again, across this very wide range of, of customers, you know, there's the, the folks, Pollywood that we talked to are ma- making recycled plastic furniture. Uh, there, I talked to a seeds, seeds and bulbs company, uh, American Meadows. Um, um, you know, my favorite uh, was Talesis from Lincoln, Nebraska, that's doing th- this improbable mix of security software, um, hydroponic farming, uh, uh, restauranting, and and microbrewing, uh, and and they make it all make sense <laughs> because across all those completely different sounding. Uh, businesses are some some very interesting commonalities. Um, um, I tell you, the other thing that really got me was just you know, and I just want to put this out front because it, it really struck me. And I'm still this is the thing I'm really working on is is how much we really were exposed to you know the the other economy, the one that's not necessarily you know on the front page of the business section of the you know uh, of the national news. Not, you know, you pick up the news and, and you're going to read about EVs and you're going to read about, uh, you know, about the, the the big tech companies and about, you know, uh, airplane manufacturers and, and quality control. And you go to Acumatica and you read about the rest of the industry. You read about what's happening in places like Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania, Syracuse, Indiana, you know, Odessa, tax, Texas, Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, Burlington, Vermont. Um, this is this is you know derogatorily uh, referred to maybe as the flyover countries, but there's no flyover you know in terms of importance to the economy, importance to both their local economy and you know and the national and global economy, and and seeing Acumatica's roots in that, you know, again these these terms are sort of you know almost you know a little condescending, but this the roots in these heartland you know, kinds of businesses in these heartland communities is, is fascinating to me because it's, it's, a, you know, it's the rest of the economy. We, we tend to not, not know enough about it. doesn't get enough play. And yet, you know, here they are and they're using again, this, this very broad set of services and, and software from Acumatic to do a lot of, you know, to do the things that, you know, we tend to believe are only done by global companies and only done you know, by these leading edge, bleeding edge, you know, high tech manufacturers in Silicon Valley. And in fact, it's, it's happening all over the country and it's, it's, it's all good. It's really good. It's really moving, you know, moving our, our economy forward uh, in a very positive way. So I found that really fascinating. As well. Yeah, that was uh, one of the first things uh, John Case said in his keynote. He had some stats around the impact of small small businesses on the economies and, you know, Acumatica's market. Right. And, and, and you kind of saw that, saw that during the show. Um, and then you also saw like the elements to where that can get, get companies into trouble where they need Acumatica's help. Right. The, one of the most powerful moments for me was that's 
anecdote around the, I'm forgetting the name of the customer now. I was about to look it up uh, that had the fire. Portacool. Yeah, Portacool yeah, from yeah. from Center, Texas, the center of Texas, apparently. Yeah, and 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 then sang on the keynote stage like that they got that call from Acumatica saying, you know, don't don't pay us for three months. And, you know, just, just kind of a little bit of an emotional moment, right? It wasn't like a, it didn't feel like a PR moment, but it kind of struck you like this is a different kind of customer and company, right? Where it's a different type of relationship. And, you know, so one of the things I was digging into was like, why are Acumatica customers so relatively happy? I mean, uh, on an ERP scale, they're definitely on the very high end, I think. And, and that's very palpable, right? And, and I have a, I have a couple ideas as to why, why that is, but I'm curious if, if you have thoughts. Well, you know, I, I think it, 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 uh, one of my, one of the main ideas, and it's a strength and, and a potential weakness, which I brought up a couple of times with some of the, the execs is, you know, they, they, they have this very well-established uh, partner model. Uh, the partners are very themselves small businesses that, you know, you get to be as a small and medium side business, do it, you get to do business with an, with someone like you, someone in your, in your mold, if you will. Um, and in theory, they, you know, they're going to get you better than a, you know, than a global systems integrator would. Uh, and I think that that's very, very powerful. That connection, it's a, you know, Acumatics is a relatively small vendor. It's got relatively small partners selling to relatively small companies, it sort of feels like one big happy family. I think, I think that's, you know, that's very, very powerful. I think it, it is a we potential weakness in that, that, you know, the, the growth that, that Acumatica wants to continue to, to achieve, and they're doing a, apparently a really good job at it, um, is really dependent on, on the quality of this, you know, this channel and these partners. And they're, you know, and I did talk to a couple of customers who, you know, who had, had to really sort through a little bit of that quality problem. Uh, very understandably so, but it's it's always it's always complicated managing a channel like that. So it's a you know it's a it's a big plus and and something you got to you got to work really hard on continually to keep it in the in the plus side of the the column. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the that that was a topic that brought up a bit with uh, with our mm -hmm. meeting with the chief revenue officer who's been uh, at Acumatica since 2021, uh, Sankit Akakar. And I thought he had some pretty good answers because one of my concerns was about how do you monitor those relationships and <clears throat> and intervene sooner when when they do go awry. And he had some pretty good answers as far as some of the indicators they track uh, that they kind of flag things, you know, like delayed implementation, start times, and things like that, where they do get more involved. Um, but but the point stands in the sense that the more like Acumatica, John Case really credited the industry additions of Acumatica, things like manufacturing and distribution with the, with the vast majority of their growth, including construction as well, is the vast majority of their, their growth um, the last few years. Um, but that really highlights the partner thing that you, you focused on because that also means that you need partners that, that have a deeper understanding of those industry areas, which makes the partner problem more challenging, right? Because right. this is no longer like general ERP where, oh yeah, just talk to this other person that does ERP. It's like, no, I, I want to talk to someone who understands where my industry is headed, where the benchmarks are, where, where customers in my industry are struggling. Like, oh, and I might want someone that's closer to my region too. Like, so you need a more diversified partner um, stream if you're going to realize the strategy of growth that they want to achieve. So right. I think you're right. And, and you know, and these companies have very interesting, you know, there's, they may be small, but they're, they have some mighty interesting problems. So, you know, American Meadows, the, the seeds and bulbs guys in Vermont, um, you know, they just talked about this very fascinating business problem, which is that they're going to sell you bulbs, two of bulbs in December that they're not going to deliver to you until spring. Right. And they have to book that revenue. And yet, Set a set set a, set it aside essentially, and manage the fact that you know the fulfillment of that order doesn't happen for X number of months. And how do you make sure that that you know that's accounted for correctly? How do you make sure that you're tracking that customer correctly? It's it's not it's not the same as as a typical business. It's a very interesting, complex model. And of course, you know they have their own sourcing issues, right? I mean, sourcing bulbs, uh, I. In a former life, I actually worked on a tulip farm harvesting tulip bulbs. You know, you 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 cut the tops of the flowers off in the spring. You pull those bulbs out in in you know in in the early summer. 
um, you're you're trying to source something that is doesn't exist yet, that that is just a you know literally a seed in the ground, um, and you have to have these contracts from on the sourcing side that that reflect a certain amount of variability about you know, delivery. Anyway, you know, so so every every one of these conversations involves this very very unique problem that uh, I talked to uh, this company OFS International. They do tubing and piping for the oil and gas industry. Um, They've got they've got a really interesting problem. They're very high tech in their industry. For their industry, they're super high tech. They're working with these wildcatters who you know who don't who don't do tech. They do they dig holes in the ground. They pull you know, they 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 pull liquids out of the ground. And trying to you know their dilemma is not so much eh, does Acumatica help their business, but how do they take what Acumatica does and and essentially package it in a way that that works for this. This low, very, very low tech, tech customer base. Um, same thing with American Asphalt and down down the road for me in Hayward, California. The asphalt that, that's like one of the most untech worlds possible, and yet you know you you're, you've got to. Everyone's got to make that more efficient. You can't just you know sit sit in the twentieth century model anymore. With that kind of delivery, so so there, every company has this very unique kind of set of problems they're trying to sort through, and to me, it's fascinating that one of the big answers to this set of problems is Acumatica, despite the fact that these problems are so vastly different from. So let's head on that for a moment because this is a really important point. So that this notion has been established, I think, for some years now that that a lot of cu- customers like Acumatica's customers. They might be smaller, but their business problems are just about as complicated as as large enterprise. So, so that's important, right? So you're like, well, how does the software accommodate that? And while Acumatica does have on-premise deployment option as one of them, the vast majority of their new customers, like more than 95%, are doing their their SaaS offering. And um, most of those are are doing this always current program. And so Acumatica has been you know, have pretty good track record of keeping these customers current on new releases. So what that means is what I think is really interesting. And I think this is one reason for Acumatica customer loyalty, and you hear it in these interviews is, I'll see what you think of this, is this ability to configure because SaaS ERP historically was viewed one of the trade-offs you hear. Like if you listen to folks like Eric Kimberling, who, who does this for a living, he says the trade-off is that it's standard and vanilla. And yet you talk with these customers and they, it doesn't sound very vanilla, Josh. It sounds like they're able to customize this quite effectively, but here's the key, not disqualify them from future upgrades uh, on the program. So they're not deviating into custom code and disqualifying themselves from new features. So that's a really interesting aspect of this, I think. Yeah, though I did talk to one company, and maybe I won't mention their name just because... It, you know, they they are the one. You know, they they did tell tell me very specifically they have, you know, a, a few too many customizations uh, that right. they've done in Acumatium is that classic old story. And now, how do they roll them forward? Um, and um, right, you know, and again with that that again, you know, some of them were there because it wasn't in core. Now it's in core. Some of them are unique to their business. And, well, know, and you still don't want to do excessive customizations you know, beyond what you have to, but, but the point, you know, be, because there's all kinds of implications when you're, when you're integrating with other software programs as well, other cloud software and stuff. So you still don't want to go f- too far down that road. And that's why you need a good partner that can advise you as to like what you should, should do. But the point is, it's just interesting because this is not a, v- these are not vanilla SaaS conversations that we're having. And I think that's cool. I would also say that I think Customers feel very liberated, liberated by the licensing scheme, and I've been at giving Acumatic a hard a hard time about this in the past because, like a lot of times when you say things about your company, so for example, Acumatic could say, "Well, you know, we do industry really well. Um, you know, we 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 have great composability, whatever." Well, sorry, but every cloud ERP vendor on the planet is saying those things right now, <laughs> and and so it becomes up to the customer to evaluate the veracity of those claims, but no other cloud ERP vendor can say we have licensing that's based on consumption models, not on user models. And and that might sound good, but then you talk with customers and they're the ones that really appreciate it. And this year, we really heard that from the keynote stage, both from Acumatica, John Case, but also from customers. And having gone to their shows since 2014, I was really struck by that this year where 
And maybe it's partially because economic times are more difficult now, but that flex ability to kind of bring quickly casual users in or make seasonal adjustments to who has access to the system, that's a really defining characteristic, I think, that and one of the major reasons why customer morale is high. Yeah. And and I think also, you know, what what that model lets you do is really, you know, apply the software to the place, the, to the point of greatest need and and work work out from there. So you, you're, you know, you can really in a way afford to start start small and and grow big and not have to start small but pay big. Um and I think that's that's very much appreciated. Um the you know the 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 general I have to say, you know, the other thing and these again I, I haven't been there in a while. So I was really struck by the fact that you know you walk walking down that main hall uh, on the way to you know the keynote theater and, and there's this show these showcases of all the different companies, you know, not all of them, a bunch of companies who are there as customers showing their products, showing who they are, what they make, these these wonderful, cool, interesting things. Uh, some of them we might even own, a few of us. Um, having that ability to to, you know, to 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 sort of bring the real world of their businesses to light and and with with the pride that they obviously have. In you know, in making great products, um, you know, I, I just felt that the 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 general sort of the vibe, the the feeling, the the ethos of that that conference was, you know, was all about these customers being successful and being successful on their terms, and in Acumatica being there to you know kind of cheer them along. Um, and again, it's not all you know, it's not all perfect. There's definitely questions of you know that different customers had. Uh, you know about how do they move forward in this direction or that direction, and they're, you know they're 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 pushing you know they're pushing the company as they need to, and the company I think is generally listening as they should. Um, but it's um, it, you know there's there's a culture there as well that I found very very um, very compelling and, and and quite maybe different a little bit from some of the more more you know dis- disengaged. Big, big companies that they're just trying to make sales quota every quarter. I think the other thing that's nice about this this industry and these smaller companies is, of course, these individuals are playing multiple roles in their companies. So you're not just talking to a siloed person in a single, you know, in a single domain in a big company. You're talking to someone who's re- who really does have to look across the you know the, their whole company in order to ensure the success happens. And Acumatica allows them to, you know, to a certain extent to have that perspective. I think that's very, very, um, that, that's refreshing, to be honest. Yeah, I want to um, hit on a couple of concerns that I have in a moment, um, because I don't want to do a, this vendor is too good to be true type podcast, because no. that would strain the credibility of our, of our, of our listeners. But I, but I do think it is important to think about, like, why is morale so particularly high <laughs> you know, in these customers and partners and, and understand what the factors are, because I think we can all learn from that. And and one other thing that I would point to, Josh, is I think, you know, Acumatica has gone into industries that haven't really had what you might call modern ERP solutions to consider. And construction is a really interesting example, because I've talked to a number of construction customers since they launched that several years ago. And there's, historically, there's been this trade-off where uh, you know, even if there's some new different software, it's like, well, the functionality doesn't stack up. So I'm sticking with my green screen software because it has the richer, deeper functionality for my industry. Well, that's cool to a point, but there's a huge problem with those kinds of functionality comparisons because one of them is that good luck getting next generation talent to sign on to work at your company when you have to log into a DOS type interface to manage your day. Like, have fun with that. Wait, right. what do you mean I can't do this on my mobile phone? Like, what if I'm not, what if I can't come to the office that, whatever? Like, and so I think the other thing, and in you know, Acumatica is not the only vendor that's pursued this type of thing, but I think they've done a really good job in these industries where I've talked with construction customers who said, yeah, Acumatica didn't have every single box check that we were looking for, but we loved the software. We loved how easy it was to use. We loved the mobile capabilities. And we knew that we would continue to get this functionality delivered on a six-month interval. And so then that puts the onus, of course, on Acumatica to make sure they're delivering 
what customers want at, at a proper rhythm that they can absorb it without getting overwhelmed and stuff like that. So there, that's not necessarily a simple thing. But the point is that I think that's a fascinating change that we're seeing in the market where now you can, as a buyer, you can you can kind of take that functionality grid and not live as that is religion, but just one factor and other factors like the caliber of my relationship with that vendor, <laughs> like like the 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 licensing experience, the the ability to add new stuff in a collaborative manner, those become key criteria. And to me, that's huge because these are now lifelong relationships. This is no longer put in your software and walk away. This is about the sort of continuous improvement cycle. So I don't know what you think of that, but I think that's the other key piece that jumps out to me. Yeah. I mean, I mean, why why customer sat is so high? Well, you know, and, and you you hit on it a second ago. I mean, a lot of these customers are starting from scratch and that's being polite they're starting from nowhere right. and so you know it's they've exciting. outgrown or they've outgrown their older yeah. software older legacy old systems old stuff right they've been they, dancing they push, on- they push quickbooks to the absolute limits and beyond they're stuck right. in spreadsheets somewhere whatever like yeah. yeah so you know you've been you've been dancing all night in a pair of tight shoes and you finally take them off ah you know everything feels great um the question is you know you know what what happens the next night and the next night and the next night and so you know there are there are some there are some some places definitely where this company you know needs to, needs to keep moving forward and keep the momentum because they're missing they're missing some 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 things and you know it's fair to say that that they can't they certainly can't be perfect they don't you know they, and and we would be grossly amiss remiss to say that um, but I th- I think that there are you know the nice thing about really listening to the kind of customers that are in this industry is that they, you know, they're not, they're not necessarily, you know, seasoned, you know, IT focused companies. Their companies have been working on their business and trying to use some tech to make it better. And and they've come to Acumatic because they realize they need to move forward with, you know, a, a real next generation product. So again, they, they, part of the benefit that Acumatica gets is that they're the, you know, they're the, they're the, you know they're the first date um, um, that some of these companies have had in in this tech world, um, but I th- I think that you know I I think that there's a there is you know they they're smart enough to know that they can't they don't want to squander that you know you can't you can't, and and here's the thing I mean you and I have talked about other vendors we're not going to name names here who who really focus on commercial success and compl- and and therefore drive a ton of complexity. Into the into the commercial relationship with their co- companies and the, with their customers, and and I didn't I really feel that's not happening here, and I think there's a there's a tremendous relief um, inside the customer base that they're not being treated, if you will, that way. Um, this is not a publicly traded company; they're not you know they're not beholden to the quarterly cadence of Wall Street. Yep. Um, and I think that that's part of the reason it's also refreshing is to sort of see what happens when you when you really focus on the customer is the customer and not the investor is the customer. I, I like that focus a lot. Yeah. I think in that, if I, you know, when we get into the final section, I want to hit on a few concerns. I think one of my big concerns going forward would be the future as, as Hackymatic continues to grow, because in this industry, what we know is that eventually there's some kind of event that happens in that growth cycle. And I, I would be really Sorry to see Acumatic, for example, get acquired uh, by a larger entity with a different business model and approach um, in the future. And that's not for consideration now. But, you you know, you think about that, that's the value of remaining private only goes for so long. Like, right. you know, there, there's very few vendors that are truly privately held. Like Ac- Acumatica does have private equity involved. And those people, you know, look, they they are looking for ROI, too, eventually. And so... You know, personally, I'd like to see Acumatica evolve into a publicly traded company because I think that is a better scenario for them than most acquisitions. But we'll see. I mean, you never know. But I think that's the one thing is that'll be interesting to track. But that's not a story for this year or next year. I think that's a little bit ways out. Um, But you can't remain independent forever. So that is one interesting thing to kind of monitor a little bit. Um, But um, the other things I liked about Acumatica... I'm not going to delve fully into the AI stuff because I wrote a 2,000 word piece on that. You can read it at your leisure on Diginomica. But uh, I like that they didn't overplay that and kept a ruthlessly practical focus on AI with allow with you know talking about it, but not allowing it to take over their conference. I also like their ESG approach. A lot of vendors are are really backing down publicly on ESG right now because 
they they don't want to take the political blowback, which I find really annoying because ESG and sustainability, politicizing that topic is really lame. Like, like yes, you can have a political conversation about climate change if you want, but that's not what vendors need <laughs> from this functionality right now. They need to manage energy costs better. They need to manage wa- waste better. They need to save money. They need to do things for very practical reasons, and let's have that conversation. I would just say that Acumatica has still a long way to go in terms of embedding that functionality into their product. But talking with Pollywood, Pollywood's very, very happy running on Acumatica with all the tracking and tracing and precision they're able to apply. And that's just out of the box with what they're doing now without any ESG-specific functionality built into the system at all. So Acumatica's got a good good momentum there. I'd like to see them continue it. So I really like that also. Yeah. Yeah, and Pollywood, you know, being the, you know, the, the manufacturer and vendor of recycled plastic furniture. I mean, they're, they're, they're taking HDPE plastic and turning it into Adirondack lawn chairs. Um, they're they're the, the ultimate green business in a lot of ways. Um, uh, and, and yeah, so they're, 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 living the, they're living the life of the ESG vendor and using Acumatica to do it. And, and it's, not, it's, not, it's nothing special. It's just what they do. Um, so that, yeah. I think that's a, that's a pretty powerful story. So let's hit on just a couple of concerns because for the most part, you know, I think this is a company that's executing very well. We can, we can learn a lot from that, uh, from a customer's perspective, but, um, a couple of concerns that I would raise. One is, uh, customers have still a lot of needs around dashboarding and reporting. So there's, that's been a common theme of like, I wish there was more of that. This doesn't go for all customers. Some customers really swear by Acumatic because they call them side panels, but they're kind of embedded displays. So some customers really like that, but. Uh, Acumatica from the keynote stage on the product day two committed to improving those features. There are some third party partners that provide really good functionality in those areas. So it's not like there's nothing that customers can do there, but that's been a common sort of request that I think, um, you know, Acumatica will need to deliver on. And, and then, um, I would add also from an event standpoint, because I was watching some of the keynotes on the virtual stream, uh, I learned that a lot of the virtual session content isn't available except for keynotes. Uh, I think in the future, Acumatica needs to really expand what's available virtually for attendees. There seems to be sometimes a misunderstanding that like that maybe those two things are in conflict and they're not, but some points were made on the stream around like, look, I can't send my whole team to Las Vegas as much as I'd like to be there. And I think it, it's time to really acknowledge that as great as these in-person events are, for a lot of different reasons, we can't all be there. And we need to figure out how to serve people that matter it's not the case that everyone that matters is on site. That that's the wrong way to look at it. And and so so there's a lot of work Acumatica can do there. I think and I and and that would play very well to their overall training because so much of their training is free. I sent you a link this morning of all these learning paths that they have right. that are super awesome and that are all free to consume. And so let's just tie the event content into that as well. So those would be my concern items. Anything else? Uh, you raised the partner one earlier. Yeah, I think the partner one and, 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 you know, also I just, you know, you sort of, you know, talking to these customers, like what, what else are you using? Um, there's a lot of Salesforce in the customer base. Um, and that's, that tells me that, you know, and, and there's a certain irony because Salesforce is not cheap. <laughs> it's not priced, uh, or, or, or licensed in any way. So you perform similar to Acumatica and, um, that speaks to a big, a big gap that they need to potentially talk about. I had a couple of customers talk to me about payroll. That's another payroll is the eternal, the eternal problem. Yep. Um, uh, so you they do have partners that service some of that, but, but to your point, yep. yeah, it, it needs yep. to, it needs to go up upstream a little bit. Um, yep. you know, and I think, um, I think the analytics, you know, BI analytics was, as, you know, as you mentioned, I, I, you know, I heard, heard stories about that as well. And in fact, you know, um, some of them really, you know, were they were trying to make some choices about some not necessarily inexpensive third parties um, that they felt might be the right ones because they felt like they weren't necessarily going to get it from Acumatic or 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 the you know or the partners. So you know those those are those are some they're, they're not they're not unknown gaps. They're they're known. They're not surprising. Um, but I think you know as as they sort of move forward and try to cover as much of the customer need as possible um, when it, whenever possible. I think those are, those are a couple of things that I saw um, 
you know, I, I, you know, I saw sort of standing out uh, in front of me. Um, you know, and, and I just want to say, I mean, the thing about the partner uh, program, it's, it's. I just want to tell a quick anecdote because, because it sort of rang true with um, our, our host Jim Dessler's running that show. And you know, they, they when I used to follow Microsoft very closely back in the day, you know, they would always bring the analyst in, in front of the guy running um, running the partner program, and he would he would run through this. This you know rather rather comprehensive briefing on all the things they're doing to tweak that program because it was it was n- not working right it needed needed constant revision it was this you know it's this it's this continuous headache that needed to be managed from from internally and then you step aside and go out in the rest of the market and every 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 competitor is saying God I wish I had a program like Microsoft's um, mm. and the story the the moral of the story is you can never do enough in the partner ecosystem to make it. Uh, you know, to structure it correctly for the customers. So I, I really, to me, that was a real takeaway is that you want this continuous growth. You want this incredible, you know, customer satisfaction to, to, to grow and not, and not stagnate. This is going to be a, a really big, <laughs> a big lift to keep the momentum in the partner program as, as strong as possible. And a couple of partners did, uh, a couple of customers did say, you know, they had to, Go back to Acumatic and get another partner. The, the first partner they picked, the first partner they were given, wasn't the right one. Um, and I can't emphasize, as I keep doing, enough that this is this is a this is a you know this is a a potential inhibitor to growth that they're going to have to really focus on. Yeah, and you know you hear I definitely hear from customers like really good partner stories, and then I also hear at times, and this gets back to some themes that are right in your wheelhouse around that customers really need to own these relationships. So sometimes it's not just a matter of whether you have a good partner or not. It's the caliber of that relationship. Like I talked to a customer that was rebooting a lot of of their pro- projects after they felt they had stalled out in the last year. And they had a very frank conversation with their with their partner about that in a productive conversation. And 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 they're moving forward with that partner, but that conversation needed to happen. And I think that that's customers really, I think, in, in any of our ERP scenarios that we look at or really anything else, like they have to own right. that a little bit more than they're used to owning rather than saying, oh, you know, let's put our trust in this partner to deliver everything. There needs to be this really sense of like, well, how do we measure that? How do we know we're on the right track? And And some of that's just relationship stuff and it's not easy. And so I think it's really important. So I'm glad you brought that up. Right, and you know, and just as we know, right, and these are you know, if you if you if you mess up a project in a in a large multinational or even a decent sized company, you're 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 going to be fine. If you mess up a big project in a small company like some of these, you could really take the company down. And you know, I like as you, as you point out what Sanket was saying about some of these, you know, some of the some of the programmatic things they're going to do to keep an eye on this stuff because it, it is it is absolutely critical you get it right the first time. Uh, you yeah. don't necessarily have a second a second act in 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 these smaller companies to to do this kind of transformation that that they they all need and they desperately do and again particularly because they're transforming from as you said you know DOS green screen you know to to yeah. modern ERP and and that's 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 exceptionally non trivial to do that. Yep, lots of really juicy change management stories as well, right? Which is the other area for customers where. They, there's a lot of uh, challenges there, you know, in these industries like construction, getting getting folks, you know, bought into the news. So we could have a whole different podcast about that. But fascinating event. Really glad that you were there so I could get your take. And uh, I really enjoyed that conversation. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, thank you. I look forward to next year. This is a, this is a company worth, worth, you know, worth keeping an eye on. They do some interesting work. Um, Absolutely. And I think they're setting us some interesting standards for the rest of the industry as well, which is which is good. Very good. See you in Texas. <laughs> yeah. Bring it Catch on. Up. Catch you Tuesday, yeah. man. Thanks a lot. Later.